Good morning, everybody. Um, I am recording this lecture on ligaments just because I'm getting my second vaccine shot today later on, and I'm a little concerned that uh, maybe some of the side effects will keep me out of school. So I want to make sure that we uh, we have this just in case, right? So um, our topic uh, today is going to be ligaments, um, and the ligaments in our body are what are necessary to hold our uh, bones together. Okay, so they hold bone to bone. They also hold other structures together uh, and they help to stabilize our, uh, our bones, um, you know, so that they're not just kind of all just flopping around, but they're stabilized and held in place. Uh, and ligaments are made of dense fibrous connective tissue. So what is that? It's, it's a whole lot of the protein collagen, uh, these collagen fibers with a few cells mixed in. Okay, and those cells that make the collagen fibers are called fibroblasts. Um, but both ligaments and tendons are made of this dense fibrous connective tissue. Really the only difference between a ligament and a tendon is that ligaments hold bone to bone, tendons hold muscle to bone, okay? Um, so there are several ligaments you're gonna need to know uh, and be able to identify, tell me where they are, um, a little bit about what they do. So in the elbow, there are three ligaments you're gonna have to know, in the wrist, there's one, and in the knee, there are four. And I'm gonna go through the ligaments of the elbow, then the, the ligament in the wrist, and then the ligaments in the knee uh, here today. So we'll start with the first ligament in the elbow that I wanna talk about is called the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, it's also called the medial collateral ligament of the elbow and notice of the elbow because there's also a medial collateral ligament of the knee. So you got to differentiate between the two. So the ulnar collateral ligament connects the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So on the inside of the elbow here, okay, uh, to the coronoid process of the ulna. So you can see the ulnar collateral ligament coming down right here. Uh, it kind of splits a little bit, attaches to a couple different spots on the ulna, uh, but it helps to hold the humerus and ulna together. Okay. Uh, the second ligament is one we actually mentioned when I talked about the pivot joint uh, earlier, and that is the annular ligament that goes around or encircles the head of the radius. Um, and so it holds the head of the radius again, tight up against the, um, against the ulna here. And so this view, we're looking down. Um, this is the electron process. It's been cut through. There's a notch called the radial notch that the head of the radius sits into. And then this ligament goes around the head of the radius and holds it up against the ulna here. Okay. The radial collateral ligament connects the lateral epicondyle of the humerus to the annular ligament. So it doesn't connect to a bone, it connects to another ligament, right? So the radial collateral ligament uh, is uh, running right here from the lateral epicondyle, so the outside of the elbow, um, down to the annular ligament that wraps around the head of the radius and helps to hold, uh, hold all these bones together here, okay? Uh, so those are the three bones of the elbow. Now, the ulnar collateral ligament, you may have heard about this if you uh, are involved in any kind of sports that involve throwing, right? The ulnar collateral ligament can tear due to repetitive use, and it's common in athletes who participate in overhead throwing sports like baseball and softball. Um, it's not as common in football, uh, but it could happen there. Okay, uh, this pitcher right here, his name's Chris Sale, he used to pitch for the White Sox, he pitches for the Red Sox now. Um, but this picture shows a, uh, gives you a really good idea of the kind of strain that throwing a uh, baseball repetitively and hard puts on a pitcher's arm and especially that inside part of the elbow as they're reaching back. You can see that that's going to put a lot of strain and mechanical stress on that ulnar collateral ligament that's holding the medial epicondyle, the humerus, to the, uh, to the ulna here. Okay. So what happens is you get a bunch of little tears over time from repetitive use and eventually you get a big tear and you, you'll feel a sharp pain in the acceleration part of the throw uh, as you're bringing that hand forward. So these are a couple of MRIs that show you where the torn ligament is located here. Uh, and if you are just, you know, your average Joe who doesn't play like an overhead throwing sport for a profession, that tear won't really affect your normal daily activities. So unless you wish to continue throwing and being able to throw, there are non-surgical avail uh, options available to help repair, but not repair to the same state it was initially, rest anti-inflammatories like, um, you know, Advil and stronger anti-inflammatories a doctor could prescribe, 
ice and uh, physical therapy to strengthen the muscle around that joint to help stabilize uh, those bones as well. Now, um, there is the, you can get a surgery to done to repair the tendon um, or to repair the, the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, and generally what will be done is a tendon will be taken from the person's own forearm or a toe tendon, uh, because there are two that go to the big toe, you only really need one, a hamstring tendon, because we have several of those, or part of the Achilles, okay? Uh, and taking that tendon is called taking a graft. Um, now you might say, well, we're repairing a ligament, why would we be taking a tendon, right? But remember, ligaments and tendons are made out of the same material. The only difference between them is what they hold together with ligaments bone to bone and tendons muscle to bone. You need a tendon that's about 15 to 18 centimeters long, and it can be taken from your own body, in which case it's called an autograft. Um, and so you're not going to reject it. Uh, if you are younger, uh, that's a good option because your tendon should still be kind of fresh and, um, and uh, pliable like they're, like they're supposed to be. You could also take the tendon from a cadaver. Uh, and that's called an allograft. Um, the problem with this, if you're younger, is those uh, cadaver tendons are going to be older and more used than your own tendons. Um, so uh, the advantage, though, is that you are going to recover faster because taking one of your own tendons and then using it in your elbow requires two surgeries, right? One to remove the tendon and then one to repair the torn ligament. To, an allograft just requires you to go through one surgery, and that is the insertion of the new tendon to replace that ligament that was uh, that was torn. Okay, so there's pluses and minuses to both. Uh, but what happens to for this surgery is that uh, holes are drilled in the um, in the humerus and in the ulna, and then the tendon is weaved between those uh, holes in the bones in a figure eight kind of pattern here. Um, and the repair of this ligament is only done. Uh, so we only so usually we replace this ligament. The only time we would do a repair of the ligament is if the ligament tears away from the uh, medial epicondyle, the humerus, um, and then that's called an avulsion. Uh, and usually a piece of the bone comes off with it, and it can be really painful. So this is, by the way, this is called Tommy John surgery because the first guy to ever have this surgery uh, was a pitcher um, in the 1970s and 80s maybe even the 60s, but he, um, he tore his ulnar collateral ligament and went in and, and had this surgery done. Um, uh, and so it's been named after him because he was the first guy to have it done. Um, and when we, you know, that's a pretty big deal to be the first person to volunteer for an experimental surgery on your arm when your arm is what you make a living with. Uh, and uh, the success rate from then to now is dramatically better with the with Tommy John surgery. Okay, all right. Uh, so those are the three ligaments of the writ of the elbow. We're going to take a look at the uh, ligament, the one ligament in the wrist that I want to talk about, which is the transverse carpal ligament, also called the flexor retinaculum or the anterior annual annular ligament. We're just going to go with transverse carpal, is what you need to know. I like to throw those other ones out there in case you ever come across them in the future. If you're going into a uh, medical field, maybe you, maybe you would see them. And so, uh, so now you at least have an understanding of what they are. So what the transverse carpal ligament does is it goes from one side of the wrist to the other and connects the carpals on one side of the wrist to carpals on the other. Uh, so it connects two carpal bones on the medial side of the wrist called the pisiform and hamate bones to two on the lateral side of your wrist called the scaphoid and trapezium. Uh, bones, and those are just different carpal bones. Um, and notice here that those bones, along with this ligament, create a tunnel, and there are nine tendons that run up through that little tunnel uh, that's made up to your fingers, as well as a nerve called the median nerve that goes to your thumb, index finger, middle finger, and the uh, inner, the medial portion of your ring finger here, okay? Now, you may have heard of people getting carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, what happens here with carpal tunnel syndrome is that uh, one of these nine tendons gets inflamed from repetitive use. It's just a repetitive use injury, like doing a whole lot of typing. One of them gets inflamed and then pushes on that median nerve. Uh, and so you get this nerve pain and this numbness. Uh, and the numbness is in your, in your thumb, index finger, middle finger, and the inner part of your ring finger because that's where the nerve uh, goes to, right? So as soon as the doctor hears those symptoms, they know the anatomy of, of your wrist and your hand. They know that that median nerve, it innervates those, 
those uh, four fingers and he knows exactly what's going on because he understands the anatomy um, and he can make a diagnosis right there. Uh, and so you might end up having to have surgery or physical therapy. Uh, and the reason that this happens, that these, if these inf get inflamed, they push on that median nerve, is that this ligament, if these get inflamed, it's not like they can push up on the ligament. The ligament doesn't stretch, and neither do the bones, obviously. So the only place to go is to push out, push, uh, out on, that, on that nerve. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we get pain and numbness in those fingers. All right. Now, last, uh, last part that we'll take a look at is what, goes, what we have in our knee. Uh, and we know that in the knee, we have two discs uh, made of fibrocartilage that partially divide the joint. And those discs are called the menisci. Meniscus is singular, menisci is, is plural. And we're going to have a medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus. Here's our medial meniscus on the inner half of the knee. Here's the lateral meniscus on the lateral part of the knee. And this partially divides the joint. Um, they're both attached to the tibia, notice. And what they do is they help to disperse the friction and reduce friction between the femur and the tibia as your knee is bending, okay? If you hear that somebody has torn cartilage in their knee, what they've torn is, is one or both of their uh, menisci. And you might hear, uh, if you ever uh, have had a knee injury, sometimes the doctor will refer to an unhappy triad where you tear uh, the ACL, which I'm sure you've heard of, the MCL, which you may have heard of, and the medial meniscus as a result of a, a really bad injury, like in the soccer field or uh, football field or some other uh, sport, uh, basketball. Um, so your knee ligaments, let's take a look at those, right? We have the medial collateral ligament that uh, runs on the inner part of the knee right here. It's also called the tibial collateral ligament. Um, and it attaches the medial epicondyle of the femur to the medial condyle of the tibia. Okay, um, and it resists forces that push the knee medially. So if you get hit from the outside of your knee and cause that knee to bend inwards, this kind of resists those forces. Uh, and what's interesting, and, and we mentioned this in my in the in our three B class, is that this this ligament here is partially attached also to the medial meniscus. That makes this ligament less flexible and more likely to tear. And usually if you tear the MCL, you also tear that medial meniscus, okay? So an MCL tear is caused by pressure to, or stress to the outside part of the knee. Here you can see this quarterback. He used to be the quarterback of the Ravens. His name is Joe Flacco. He's getting sacked right here. And this guy's helmet is pushing on the outside half of his knee, pushing it inwards. And this actually caused a tear of his medial meniscus, okay? Uh, if you twist while you're, if you twist your leg while your your lower leg is planted and your leg twists, that can cause a tear. And a lot of times when you tear your MCL, you also tear your ACL. Uh, and so you, you we have these grade one injuries. A partial tear of the MCL is a grade one injury. A complete tear of the MCL, but the ACL is still intact, is grade two. And if you tear the MCL and ACL, that's considered to be a grade three injury. All right, uh, on the outer half of the knee, we have what's called the lateral collateral ligament. It's also called the fibular collateral ligament because it's going to connect the lateral epicondyle of the, of the, of the knee with the head of the fibula, okay? The lateral epicondyle of the femur to the head of the fibula. It's not connected to any of the menisci or any other ligament, uh, so it's more flexible than the medial collateral ligament, and it's less likely to tear. Uh, it's going to take a pretty traumatic knee injury for it to tear. Um, it can be it can tear as a result of pressure on the medial side of the knee, and if it tears, it's usually not the only one that's torn. If that one tears, you probably have a whole lot of other ligaments torn as well. Um, and so I was actually watching uh, this football game. This guy, his, he was a running back. His name was Marcus Lattimore for South Carolina. He was going to be like a number one uh, first round draft pick. Um, somewhere in the first round um, in 2012, he got tackled against Tennessee. Uh, you could see this guy's head and shoulder hitting right in the knee and his knee uh, just started flopping around. It was in the wrong, wrong position. Um, and he tore the LCL as well, well as the ACL and MCL. He tore a whole bunch of ligaments there. Okay. Um, now, the one that you probably heard of the most is the anterior cruciate ligament called the ACL. And it originates on the notch of the distal femur. So the distal femur is the bottom part of the femur, right? And here's this notch. Um, and the ACL is right here. 
It attaches to the notch of that femur uh, and then inserts on the tibial plateau right here in the middle. Uh, and notice this ligament crosses with another ligament in the knee that's called the posterior cruciate ligament. Uh, and that's where the, the crossing is what we, where the cruciate uh, part of the name comes from because it crosses uh, inside the knee right there. Uh, so it crosses with the posterior cruciate ligament and it resists rotation of the tibia and the tibia moving forward in relation to the femur. Okay, so it keeps, uh, keeps those bones in line, doesn't allow that tibia to move forward. <clears throat> now, uh, when you tear that ACL, it can tear as a result of a couple of ways. If you land uh, and your, two, your tibia and your femur twist in opposite directions, that can cause the ACL to tear. Or if you get hit, you know, really uh, with your foot planted and you get hit in that knee and, and pop it backwards, that can also cause that tear. So uh, this is Darren Sproles. Uh, he was uh, running back for the Eagles at the time when this happened, when he was tackled against the Packers and tore his ACL. Uh, and then Derek Rose tore his ACL. That was one of the saddest days as a Bulls fan. Uh, he was, he jumped, didn't, he just jumped and landed and then crumpled and nobody hit him or anything else. It just, it just tore on him. Uh, my guess is there was some kind of twisting of the bones like that, but oh, that was a crushing blow as a Bulls fan when that happened. All right. Uh, and then the final knee ligament is the posterior cruciate ligament that uh, connects the posterior portion of the tibia right? It, it uh, attaches uh, to the intercondylar portion of the tibia. So between the condyles of the tibia is where the posterior cruciate ligament attaches there. Uh, and it attaches to the medial condyle of the femur. Okay. Uh, and so this re resists motion backwards, posterior motion um, of the tibia in relation to the femur. Because again, they're supposed to be in line uh, and the po posterior cruciate ligament prevent, uh, resists motion of the tibia going this way while the femur stays here. Uh, this could be injured when your knee is flexed and then a, a direct blow uh, to the knee is received when your knee is flexed. So if your knee is like, like if you're sitting down, right? Um, like in a car and you get in an accident and the dashboard hits your knee, it can pop that tibia back uh, and tear that uh, posterior cruciate ligament. That's why it's called a dashboard injury when you tear it. So to repair torn knee ligaments, um, you, grafts are taken from a hamstring tendon or the patellar tendon typically. Holes are drilled in the femur and the tibia, uh, and the tendon is then inserted into the holes and held in place with screws or staples. Uh, and sir, this, this kind of surgery has come a long way. Um, people, you know, when people were tearing their ACLs back in the 80s and 90s, you could tell because they'd have this zipper scar, right, where they had cut open the whole knee and they had stitches in, uh, to repair, to re you know, repair the, the cut afterwards. Uh, now arth arthroscopic surgery is done where a um, camera is inserted into the knee. And so everything is done through these little holes uh, that are that uh, rather than having to cut open the whole knee. Um, so it's done through small incisions in and around the knee rather than just cutting the whole knee open. <clears throat> All right. And again, these grafts could be taken from a cadaver or from your own body. Right. And we, and I talked earlier about why, what the advantage is. All right. The other injury that you maybe have experienced or know somebody who's experienced is an ankle sprain. Uh, and with an ankle sprain, like you see here, Joakim Noah in the playoffs uh, against Philadelphia, I believe. Um, and again, I was watching this game when it happened. Uh, he went to jump and his foot just bent and his ankle was basically touching the touching the ground. Um, and so what's going to happen there is you're going to uh, an ankle sprain is going to tear one or more of these ligaments that are found in the ankle or partially or completely and it's going to take a little while to repair. Notice the names of these um, names of these tendons can, or uh, ligaments, I'm sorry, can actually give you an idea of what they connect together. Like the talofibular ligament connects the talus to the fibula. The calcaneo, this, it got cut off here, but this is a calcaneofibular ligament, uh, connects the calcaneus bone, the heel bone, to the fibula, right? The, this is the tibiofibular ligament. It comes across here and connects the, the distal ends of the tibia and fibula. So these all kind of, their names tell you what they hold together, right? Um, and so if you get this um, inversion, this severe inversion, you're going to stretch and tear partially or completely one or more of these ligaments in the ankle. And that's what causes that pain. All right. So that's it on ligaments. Um, 
so I, I'm hoping I will be in class and we won't need this video, but if we do, um, uh, it will be an Ed puzzle and uh, I hope you guys have a good day.